thanks for the invitation to, to give this presentation. Uh, it's a bit of a tough task. I wasn't quite sure who to pitch this to and who's online. So as as Rod said, uh, it'd be great if you can you can leave a message in the in the Q and A of who's here. But like, we expect there's people uh, studying agribusiness, um, part of the agribusiness masterclass. Uh, people from government, hopefully, uh, interested in what's happening in cassava. And then I know we've got some very experienced people from the cassava sector, um, and we really value your comments and, and, and inputs. Um, I'm going to turn my video off uh, so it cuts down a little bit on the bandwidth, and you can see um, the, the screen. But basically, uh, yeah, as Rob mentioned, I've called this policies and pandemics understanding how the global drivers and shocks influence cassava value chain actors. And I, I think we are all aware of how crazy 2020 and, and the end of 2019 has been. Um, so it's kind of a, a fairly fitting title to a crazy, crazy time. Um, a lot of this work's been supported by, by a ACR project. It's uh, been two projects working within uh, Southeast Asia, and you can follow some of the work of that project on on the Facebook group and the and the website. Um, but I, yeah, I'd like to thank Rod for for the support in in, in getting these projects initially started and, and his continued interest. So the way uh, we've approached this project, you know, we're doing a, a lot of things that other projects funded by ACR do, a lot of working with farmers at the farm level. But what we've tried to really do is understand what are those external factors that are influencing uh, what's happening um, within the value chain uh, and then how that flows through to household decisions and what that means for farmers and, and, and the economics of a new technology that we may be, be trying to play around with. And then working back out to look at, well, how does that impact households and value chains and, and global markets? So why have we taken this approach? Um, I guess looking at the graph on the right, you can see that, you know, in the life of the project, there's been some pretty gnarly trends in prices. Um, and for most farmers, they have very little understanding why this is happening. So firstly, to understand the trajectory of the industry, what are the underlying drivers that are either resulting in prices and demand falling or, or prices going up. Uh, to understand the risk uh, and what these prices mean. But we also find it's been a very useful activity in terms of building trust between actors. When a farmer sees the price halve, they start blaming factories and, and traders uh, without any real understanding of, of what their cassava is actually even used for and what's influencing the price. So to, to try and uh, shine some light and demystify the cassava market, we find it's also a useful engagement strategy. And as I said, we want to look at what these changes mean for farm level economics, what it means for livelihoods, what does it mean for the competitiveness of different actors in the sector? And the final thing is to, uh, and what uh, Dominic also presented a little bit on, is to understand what does the economics and the structure of the value chain mean for who we can engage with to get new te technologies to farmers? So what is the incentive for, for people to engage with researchers or development organisations? So quickly, I'm not sure if this will work, but I mean, what is cassava used for? And this is something uh, we find very little uh, knowledge about. So we'll have a little quick competition if, to see if the chat and interaction actually works. If, if people can go into the Q&A and start putting in uh, what they think cassava is used for, and, and we'll have a special prize for the most obscure answer. Um, but I'll give you like, one minute for answers to start coming in before we kind of move on. OK, so we've got no, no responses yet, Rod. Uh, I don't know if you need to moderate what, what I see. But basically, we have a whole range of, of products that we can 
consume every day in our modern lives. Um, so in one of the posts I made, uh, you know, cassava, the product uh, unknown by most, used by all on a daily basis. So we have things like sweeteners and MSG used in bakery products. Go to the dairy aisle in your in your supermarket. It's a good place to find uh, some cassava in the frozen food section. Um, and then of course the animal feeds, the biofuels, a, a whole range of a whole range of products that we use every day, um, be it in, in local noodle soup shops in, in Laos through to uh, high-end supermarkets in Australia or Europe. So if it's used in so many things, uh, when we come to understanding what's happening in the market, it's, um, yeah, we, it gets a little bit complicated. So I like to, to break the demand side down into some different segments. So uh, there's areas where the cassava and the demand for cassava basically competes with other forms of carbohydrate, uh, you know, in, in sectors such as animal feed and ethanol. So depending what's happening in prices in those markets, uh, you know, the, that's sort of influencing cassava. Then we have areas for cassava starch where, you know, cassava starch is largely competing on price, you know, as a substitute against maize starch or potato starch or, or sugar cane. So when we were looking at those uses, things like uh, sweeteners or, or MSG, where you can, you can use any real source of carbohydrate uh, depending on its price. And then finally, we have areas where the market really wants the functional properties of cassava starch. Uh, this is a, a growing area uh, a, a driven by consumer preferences for, for clean labels or gluten free or, or organic products. Um, so this is a, kind of an area where you're not competing on price uh, alone. And just to show you, there's a whole range of companies, global companies that are working on cassava. Um, I'm just going to check with Rod because he's shaking his head a lot whether people can actually actually hear me. So can you hear me, Rod? Yeah, so Rod's shaking his head that he can't hear me. But you can see here some of the, the large multinational companies that are, that are, you know, taking this consumer preference for the clean labels. Uh, and this is where cassava has an advantage. Uh, you can get a lot of the functional properties without doing the modification, which means it can go into food products as an ingredient rather than an additive. Um, so there's some interesting work that we won't go into today, but I'm sure some of our, our people online uh, are well aware of what, what's happening in this sector and are making investments. And, and we'll see a little bit why they're doing this as we go forward. So yeah, a multi-billion dollar commodity known, uh, what most know nothing about. As I said, this goes from farmers to government officials you're trying to engage with. Most researchers know very little about it. And as, as, as researchers are aware, most donors know very little about uh, cassava and, and its, its impact on, on livelihoods in, in the region. Of course, there's also the supply side. And again, what's happening in other sectors is going to influence what's happening on the supply side. So again, the own price relative to other commodities that people can grow in that agroecological zone, uh, which again is influenced by a range of policies uh, to support or, or uh, to penalize certain activities. Um, there's changes in, in the cost of production. Uh, and of course, we know that labor costs have been going up in the region. How easily can you mechanize that hillside in, in the north of Vietnam uh, to get those costs down to be competitive? There's uh, long-term climate impacts, uh, impacts on the, on the profitability of coffee or maize in, in areas and where cassava could uh, take its place. Of course, there's the short term impacts of, of flood and drought, which we've seen in the last 12 months really impact prices. There's changes in land suitability and land degradation, which which cuts both ways. So you have 
a land that becomes less suitable for growing other crops that moves into cassava or land that may go out of cassava into perennial crops as, as yields fall. And the last one there I've got is the impact of pest and disease, which I think is in the forefront of, of the industry's mind at the moment. So just to kind of show you where what that kind of means graphically, you can see that uh, in the last you know four four years, cassava has been a very attractive crop for smallholders. Uh, it's outperforming sugar and maize. Uh, it's been outperforming coffee. Uh, you know, palm oil and rubber, uh, all these commodities that are linked to global markets. And of course, these are influenced by policy decisions. So in Vietnam, uh, changes to the, the support to the sugar industries, meaning that sugar mills can be less competitive, which in areas like Tain In or the Central Highlands sees uh, area move to cassava. And also in Laos, you see a large area moving out of coffee as, as plantations become older into cassava, largely driven because farmers can make more money at the moment out of, of cassava. So as I said, it's been, this project's been going for about five years and it's been a, a very wild ride. Uh, we had policy reforms uh, in China that had a huge impact on prices. We had floods in, in parts of Thailand, uh, followed by drought and then CMD and, and then of course more recently the impacts of, of coronavirus. When we think about prices uh, and from an industry's perspective, and I'm sure some people online would, would be able to comment on this, you kind of you kind of got to balance it to stay where I said inside the train tracks. Uh, if prices get too high, then your secondary processes and, and next users start to look for substitutes. So when cassava starch gets too high in those applications where you can substitute for main starch, uh, you start to see that happen, which is what we're seeing in places like Indonesia that uh, are starting to use more maize starch in, in sorbitol production, for example. And on the other hand, if prices get too low, then farmers stop growing and you don't have a feedstock. So, it's in industry's interest also to try and manage those fluctuations as best as possible. But as we said before, there's, there's often a lot of things outside your control um, that, that you just kind of have to, to live with and, and, and try and take a long term uh, picture. So where is cassava grown? Um, I'm sorry if there's any people from Africa dialing in, uh, but in terms of the global export of cassava, this is very much a Southeast Asian story. But with obvious implications for Africa as it's, it tries to commercialize its cassava sector. So while making up only 13% of global area and 25% of production, basically the entirety of the global market for cassava products is originating out of Southeast Asia. Of course, during the 80s, you had the Netherlands and Germany re-exporting Thai cassava chips to other European countries. But it's largely uh, Thai, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, Philippines story. But you can see this here when we break that up over time. Indonesia, obviously the highest uh, producer early on, and you see that dramatic decline uh, in the last 10 years which I'm sure some of our Indonesian friends online can, can comment on uh, and the role of policy or lack of policy support. Then we have Thailand, the massive increase in Thailand during the 70s and 80s, again, driven by policy, uh, and we'll come back to that. Vietnam, uh, then starting to increase production, spilling over into Cambodia, and, and now we're really seeing Laos uh, picking up in terms of area and production, and I guess we'll start to move to Myanmar and other places uh, as things move forward. Because in terms of mainland Southeast Asia, whilst cassava is grown throughout the region and is still a very important famine crop, and I think we'll see that this year with, with rice supplies low, it's largely a commercial activity uh, around commercial processing hubs. So the red, the red dots indicate the number of factories in that province. And roots and chips largely flow to those commercial hubs. 
and, and then out to final markets in, in Asia, largely East Asia, China, um, Korea, and uh, Taiwan, and other places. As part of that cross-border movement, it's not only the roots and chips, but of course we see movement of uh, varieties and stem cuttings, which is contributing to some of the, the virus uh, and disease problems. We see capital moving across countries with joint ventures between companies in Thailand and Vietnam investing in, in the hinterland. We have technology, be it varieties or fertilizer or machinery. And of course, we have this huge flow of labor out of Thailand, uh, sorry, out of Cambodia and Laos into these uh, neighboring countries, which again, the current corona situation is seeing a, a massive changes in, in, in these uh, labor movements. It's not only the mainland of Southeast Asia that, that is strongly connected. Um, when we look at Indonesia, although it's we saw one of the largest producers of cassava in the world, it, it's still the second largest importer of cassava starch. Um, Indonesia's cassava production has actually uh, got two segments with the, the food consumption and then the industrial applications. And if a trader can make more money out of buying starch from out of Bangkok rather than out of Lampung, then this happens. So you can see in the graph on the right, when the orange bars are below below the line, it's cheaper to transport starch from Bangkok to Surabaya, for example, than to get it from Lampung. And we see that in the trade the trade flows. Okay, so I just want to go through some of the policies that are influencing the market and and let's get historical to start, I mean, the, the evolution of the cassava sector in Thailand was largely driven by a policy decision um, under the common agricultural policies and the protection of domestic grains in Europe, which created this opportunity for, for cassava chips out of Thailand originally into that market. And of course, with soybean coming out of the US and I guess the soybean lobby in the US probably played its part in, in, in continuing that happening. And, and there's also a range of geopolitics happening in the 70s and 80s, as I'm sure people are aware, um, in terms of um, the, uh, the Cold War and, and influence in Thailand to get people uh, engaged in commercial activities. So you can never downplay the role of politics when you're looking at, at the market development. After the, sorry, going back, you can see that after the reform of the, the cap, you basically had the export of cassava chips to Europe completely disappear. So you had an industry developed on a policy decision that was removed and then that market disappears. Uh, and it was through a lot of investment in R&D, especially in Thailand, to find alternatives for the crop that the cassava sector um, continued to, to form. You can see there was two main things that happen. The first is the a lot of research uh, and the varieties for the starch market that, that made cassava starch competitive. And also the reorientation of the chip trade to China. Um, and we'll go to that now of some of the reasons behind that. So of course, during the, the um, 2009-10, we had a lot of concerns over food security in China, who were putting in uh, price supports to ensure that they were self-sufficient in, in maize. Um, what happened though was the world market corrected uh, as, as supply in the US and South America uh, returned to normal, but the price supports remained in China and China then has to stockpile that maize. So we had a huge stockpile of maize being created in, in China, propping up the, the maize price. And similar to the impact in Europe, this is basically starting to pull other sources of carbohydrate into China, uh, be it cassava chips from Thailand and Vietnam or sorghum from Australia. Uh, you know, the, the processes in China were looking for a cheap alternative to using the domestic maize uh, and doing what they can within the trade regulations. And then there was 
there was a lot of speculation that this couldn't continue. You have this huge stockpile that's costing the country uh, millions of dollars. And then in March 2016, overnight, basically, uh, and I'm sure some people knew it was happening, but the, the price support was completely removed and the price of corn in China fell dramatically back to where it probably should be with world prices and the cassava price followed suit. And so you can see in these graphs how cassava starch uh, during that period followed the Chinese price down. And we had farmers in the region uh, getting very low prices for their roots and, and probably below the cost of production. So that, that was a big concern uh, in the first few years of the project where we were developing relationships with farmers and traders and, and all of a sudden uh, there was a huge amount of distrust between farmers and, and processors because they didn't understand why they were getting half the price they were getting previously. But as you can see, cassava prices have picked back up and now we're well above um, May. So on the right hand side, you can see um, tapioca starch FOB Bangkok versus corn starch in the US. So again, you have a, a situation where uh, cassava starch has a premium over May starch. So if you're using that starch for something like uh, sweeteners where you could be using maize starch, you probably start to think about how you can find alternative sources. And that's one of the reasons why when we go back to those pictures before where you see the, the starch sector putting a lot of time and money into R&D to, to look at those uh, new markets in terms of consumer preferences to add value to justify that, that premium. Of course, there's domestic policies in, in safe Thailand. Uh, the cassava price in Thailand follows the maize price very strongly. So you can see on the left, the maize price in Thailand has also got away from the world price. And um, there's a range of reasons for that, be it the, <coughs> excuse me, the price supports, um, the impacts of, of tariffs and quotas. And again, there is some price support for cassava currently in Thailand, um, although it's limited to a, to a smaller amount of, of production. But these policies, you know, impact the price of cassava and what farmers get, which is great until the policy is removed and you've made an investment decision based on a policy that's no longer there. The other policy I want to touch on is, is biofuel and biofuel mandates, uh, ethanol. So a, a quite a a lot of countries in the region have biofuel uh, mandates and a lot of those countries have earmarked cassava as a potential feedstock. But on the left you can see uh, like the trend of what's happening with the price of oil and the price of ethanol say out of the US and the red line is just the cost of cassava roots that you would need to buy to make ethanol. So you haven't actually made the ethanol yet, you've just bought the roots. And you can see since you know 2017, you can't even buy the roots and, and compete with uh, the costs of imported ethanol, depending on, on what the, the tax is on bringing that in. And again, on the right, you can see this is for a, uh, a processor in, in the central highlands of Vietnam, that the cost of baking uh, ethanol with molasses, dried chips or fresh roots, uh, with the feedstock being the major cost, and you're well above the futures price for, for ethanol out of the US. So basically, if you if you go down this way, you're creating demand um, by enforcing a mandate that creates demand, which is great for, for, for the farmers if that increases their price, but probably not so great if you're a starch processor trying to buy the roots and then export and be competitive against maize starch. Um, so, the, yeah, people are, in Thailand, for example, there's quite a lot of subsidies throughout the, the biofuel value chain um, from the processing to the pump. Um, and this impacts, impacts obviously the competitiveness of, of the starch sectors. And maybe there's some people online in the starch sector that would like to, to comment on that. 
And then there's a range of other non-price barriers. You have things like uh, quarantine, which in some cases we are very good and we're supporting them. In, in other cases, they're a form of non-price um, trade barrier. <coughs> um, there's a lot of restrictions that are getting put in places in places like Laos to encourage domestic uh, processing and value adding. Uh, and then, of course, there's other geopolitical concerns uh, with trade negotiations and trade wars between key players. So what I want you to take away from that, the outlook for the, you know, for the livelihoods of that lady on top is being impacted by a wide range of policies uh, aimed at um, supporting domestic farmers or achieving some self-sufficiency goals or promoting economic development. But this is not necessarily for the commodity that we're, we're interested in. And it's not necessarily in the region where either the production or consumption is occurring. So when we're, we're working with farmers and looking at, you know, should they adopt this, this uh, technology, you know, we'd have to cast a fairly broad net to look at where the market may be going. So moving on to pandemics and I, I put this photo on because it does seem a bit biblical at the moment with one uh, pandemic or uh, disaster after another. But I mean, it, it, this isn't the first time the cassava sectors dealt with this. Um, cassava mealybug was probably the, the first uh, large introduction of, of a, a pest that impacted the sector around 2000, here in 2008. When yields fell, farmers responded by, by uh, planting less of the crop. We saw prices spike and the market readjust. And I think uh, during that period, a lot of people using, say, cassava starch for something that's not very competitive against maize starch probably dropped out because you can't pay $600 a tonne for cassava starch and be competitive in some applications. The other thing, uh, of course, that we know is uh, the, the area of interest, so all these Southeast Asian and East Asian countries, some of the fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, and as that happens, we get uh, a greater consumption of animal protein, which leads to an increasing demand for, for animal feed. And this graph here probably shocks a lot of people. Uh, this is the import bill for maize in Vietnam. So whilst they may be exporting around a, a billion dollars of cassava products to the world, uh, importing close to $2.5 billion of maize alone, let alone other feed ingredients. But then we have another pandemic in, in the form of African swine fever, which is basically spread throughout that whole region we're talking about, uh, large scale culling of, of swine herds, uh, which impacts the demand for for fee. Uh, but the net impact of that, of course, has to account for what's happening in, in the other sources of protein. So what's happening in the poultry sector as people switch, uh, switch crops. Uh, one thing that becomes really clear, it's really hard to, to, to make that balance. You know, we have another uh, issue that's, that's spreading rapidly through the region and now uh, reached Australia uh, in terms of fall armyworm spread throughout the maize regions of Vietnam and now in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, you know, it's impacting the supply of maize and it's also impacting farmers' decisions about what crop they grow. So when we were in Saiburi in Laos last week, uh, a, a lot of farmers are considering not planting maize because they're worried about fall armyworm and it will change to cassava. But in terms of getting real-time information about what's happening, you know, FAO stats, you, you'll get the impact of that in about two years. Uh, national statistics, maybe you can get the information in one year. Uh, and often when you talk to people at the province level, they, they don't have a real clear idea of what's happening. So this is one thing that we'll come back to, but the ability to make decisions on what's happening in these sectors uh, relies on timely information. The final one, which is, you know, we let's get back to something close to, to the actual sector. We have a, a disease spreading rapidly through the area, cassava mosaic disease. 
reported in this area of of Cambodia uh, several years ago, and it's now largely spread throughout the major producing areas of the, of the area, with the exception we haven't found it yet uh, in, in this part of Laos or in, in here. Um, but we're being very vigilant and we'll be down there soon to, to make sure it's not there. But this is having a, a very significant impact on, on supply in some areas. This is a drone photo of some work we're doing at the moment, just showing how the disease impacts different varieties. Uh, and if people plant infected stems or, or are using clean stems. So what we're finding is if farmers plant uh, infected stems of those susceptible varieties, the impact can be very high. And we've heard farmers talk about that the yield is so low that it's uh, probably not worth you know, paying for the harvesting labour. On the other hand, uh, if we're planting uh, clean stems of varieties that are less susceptible, the impact is not so great. And we've seen farmers who are planting in Cambodia in heavily infected areas still getting 35 to 40 tonnes per hectare. The issue is we're, we're very quickly running out of sources of clean stems uh, from farmer to farmer exchange and, and the market. Um, so we're investing quite a lot of time in developing the clean seed system at the moment, as, as well as developing resistant varieties that will be tested uh, this season and going forward. In terms of the impact of this, of course, it's not the only thing that's impacting Cambodia, but you can see from 2017 to 2019, the trade in cassava roots and chips from Cambodia to Thailand dropped by $95 million. The trade from Vietnam to Vietnam dropped by $111 million. So this is a huge impact on the cassava farmers of Cambodia, often growing in cassavas where they cannot easily make that switch to an alternative crop. Uh, and often uh, we're dealing with the poorest farmers that can't make those switches to perennial crops that require a lot of upfront investment. Uh, so a very significant impact on livelihoods uh, and, the, and also the market. When we talk about the market, this is, these are some graphs that, that kind of mystify me uh, and we talk with Vietnam processors quite a lot. Here, here you have the price of cassava roots uh, converted to Thai baht at 30% and here you have the price of Thai roots converted to 30% uh, in Thailand. So basically, your processor in Vietnam is paying $30 a tonne more for roots. But then when you come over here, the, the FOV from Thay Ninh is about $40 less than Bangkok. So we have processors in, in Vietnam paying more for roots and then making less for starch. So again, this is very important information when we're talking with you know, uh, people in the value chain who think that processors are making lots of money. The margins on starch processing is very small and you need to be running that factory close to capacity in order to, you know, get the efficiencies and, and to be profitable. So what's happening to in terms to try and run that factory at, at, at full capacity and, and we had a webinar from Dominic Smith recently and you can watch that here. Basically, if you're a processor in Tainin, you're, which is which is here, you're now extending to buy cassava roots basically all the way out to the Thai border. So this line here is a $40 transport cost, and this line here is a, a $10 transport cost. So that gives us the $30 difference. Um, and we're working with some processors in Thailand to, to try and get some uh, price data for up here to kind of look at what that hinterland looks like. But what that basically means, if you're a small factory down here, you basically can't compete if you haven't got the efficiency. If you're a new factory trying to establish in Cambodia here, you're going to really struggle to compete uh, for roots uh, against Tainan. And that's what we've seen with a number of factories failing uh, that don't have the efficiencies. 
The other important point that comes out uh, when you just look at the starch price is that we shouldn't forget the importance of the co-products. So for every tonne of starch, you get basically a tonne of wet pulp. Uh, that in Vietnam, again, you saw that feed demand, uh, you know, you get $25 a tonne of, for wet pulp that goes on top of your margin. So we shouldn't we shouldn't forget those co-products that are very important in, in making uh, the industry continue. So what's happening at the moment? Uh, you know, we have these issues in Cambodia with supply being impacted by, by disease. The market has started to really look to Laos. We see massive uh, expansion in terms of the export of, of roots and, and chips at the moment. So. This is the, the data to May uh, for Thai imports from, from Laos. And so this will probably mean cassava is, uh, well, I'll go out on a limb. I'll say that cassava this year will be the largest agricultural export from Laos PDR. Um, so I, I hope that it starts to get the, the policy support uh, um, to ensure that that massive expansion is sustainable. The final one I just want to touch on is, you know, what's been happening with COVID in the last few weeks. Uh, talking to processors, initially in Vietnam especially, they had to, they couldn't get their starch into China, so we're stockpiling. Uh, you have limits in how much you can do, so they were cutting back processing capacity, which was impacting, impacting price. That massive movement of product from, from Cambodia into Tay Ninh, you see in Tainin, the, the price of Cambodian roots stayed roughly the same. But on the other side of the border, we saw root prices falling very significantly. Uh, in terms of what's causing that reduction, there's some, uh, some views that the, the roots were getting stuck at the border for, for a long time, which means they start to deteriorate and get a lower starch content. So this price is quoted at 30% starch, where this is a bulk price. So a trader has to start to, you know, to to manage that risk by offering a lower price on the Cambodian side, because when it gets to to the Vietnamese side, it, it will be deducted. Also, uncertainty uh, creates opportunities for traders to spin a story when they get to a village about why the price is is low. Um, the global demand is slowing down and we expect that to, to happen for, for quite quite a while. Um, the other large impacts were restrictions on the movement of labour and, and so we might see that in the coming crop where uh, people couldn't plant on a timely basis because uh, they couldn't bring in, in labour from outside the village to establish. But we also saw the harvesting from last crop. A lot of the crop was already harvested um, but some of it wasn't, and we're actually seeing that to be a disease refuge at the moment. So a lot of cassava witches broom in that older crop, which may potentially spill over into the, the new crop. And of course, one of the biggest impacts will be in terms of that flow of capital and the remittances and non-farm sector, which really keeps a lot of rural uh, families going. So what that means in terms of production uh, for the, the coming the coming season is a bit unclear yet, but we're trying to, to keep a watch on it. So what I want you to take away is the connectivity between countries, agricultural markets and sectors means that the price that a farmer receives in some remote upland village uh, could be impacted by a policy or a production shop thousands of kilometres away or in a completely different continent. Um, so when we're doing our value chain assessments, often we go and talk to a group of farmers and a trader and the processor, and we draw up a, a nice value chain map and maps and flows. Um, but we do this in a fairly static way, and we're not taking into account the potential global swings and downsides or potential upsides uh, that farmers may be exposed to. So here's some of the activities that we do in our project. So this. The, isn't, the numbers aren't so important, but with and without fertilizer. You know, what's the return to labor for a household with and without fertilizer? But what we also do is start to do scenario analysis. You know, what if the price is 420 kip per kilogram compared to 580? 
what happens if the yield falls to 20 tons per hectare compared to 35 tons per hectare? So then we can start to see here, you know, you're making a loss compared to here, you know, you, you're, you're very happy. Um, so this is just something that's important to do when we do those uh, economic assessments at, at the farm level. The other point I want to make, uh, and the final point, is that we really need to improve on, on getting close to real-time data available to people making decisions. So information on production, information on prices, information on policies, all value chain actors sorely need this information uh, you know, to facilitate their investment decisions. Uh, and at the moment, we have people doing some very nice analysis using historical data, showing connections between uh, different sectors. But knowing what happened you know, in the 1980s due to the cap provides very little comfort to a farmer who's trying to decide, do I plant maize or cassava this year? And do I put fertilizer on? Um, so uh, at SEAD and Biodiversity, we're, we're investing to try and get a platform where we can continue to maintain uh, this information accessible. And I want to take the opportunity to thank the private sector partners who have engaged in the project and have uh, often shared data sets and, and insights um, that we can make available uh, in this platform and we hope to see that continue. So on that, Rod, um, I want to thank everyone very much. I'm not sure if it's just me and you or uh, there's some other people there. The work will continue. Uh, you can also follow the new project um, where we will continue to keep monitoring the, um, what's happening in markets. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity and look forward to uh, any questions or interacting in the future. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, I, I am here and uh, yeah, really interesting presentation around cassava um, markets and, and global value chains. Uh, just to remind people, please um, submit any questions that you have through the online chat. Um, we'd be really um, interested in hearing what you might have to ask or any comments and you know, start, a, start a discussion around that. Um, there, there, um, there's a one coming in right now. John, there was one question. Um, um, there was one question uh, around um, the uh, around the Thai corn price and the reason why it's higher, um, and whether it's whether it's um, due to the local policy support or, or what is the reason for the, the the Thai corn price being higher. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of reasons for that. You can. You can map, if I put the Chinese price on that, it, it, it more closely reflects that. But yeah, there is there is price support um, for the crop. And then also like both Vietnam and and uh, Thailand have various tariffs on on importing, uh, you know, be it maize or, or feed wheat from Australia. Um, yeah, it's a difficult policy type rope for government to support rural communities um, versus, you know, keeping the industry going. So, yeah, I don't begrudge anyone who's a policymaker in, in trying to find that balance. Yeah. You so, see, I mean, you've highlighted the complexity of, you know, the market cassava, you know, at first, at first view, it sounds like a pretty simple commodity in a simple market, but you've highlighted the complexity of, you know, from the market and policy perspective, the impacts of disease, and you, you finished off about talking about, um, you know, the, the need for better info, uh, market and information and policy information flowing through the chain to traders and, and farmers particularly. How do you envisage, and, and I, how, how do you envisage that traders and farmers at that ground level, at the production area level, would, would use that kind of information uh, in their decision making about whether production decisions for the next year or or how they're going to manage and market in this current year? Yeah, I mean, uh, information is only useful if you can make a decision based on it, and that's why it has to be timely. Um, there's no point knowing in September that I shouldn't have planted. Um, what One of the things we're, we're trying to do is to get um, like geo-reference price data 
um, for different collection points. Uh, um, I mean, knowledge is a little bit of power. If, if you're sitting in Karachi in Cambodia and a trader tells you the price in Tainin has fallen and you've got no way to, to verify that, um, then you kind of do that. But I mean, I think I think things have got better. I mean, uh, the 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 level of farmers with mobile phones and smartphones, especially in Cambodia um, and on on social media, is quite is quite significant. So I think the opportunities for the trader to roll into a village and, and spin some lies is is um, not there. But on the other hand, like we're really trying to engage with with factories that you know, are trying to develop their supply chain. And there's some, and I think some maybe online, that are interested in providing that information and to help farmers increase their their productivity. Because as you saw for a processor, if if they're not getting the feedstock and, and doing the turnover, the, the margin's so small they start not to be profitable. Um, now the issue which we touched on last week is in a situation where you have taken in with say 50 factories, how do you how do you get the the collective to invest in this? Because you know there's a lot of uh, issues around free riding and uh, and not being able to capture the benefit of your investment. So um, I think I think we're you know the market leaders and and we had some of their logos up there before have to have to take a role and pull the industry along of how do we provide information that helps farmers make those decisions? Yeah. Just, um, you, you know, you mentioned about the impacts of, of, of disease, particularly mosaic virus. Um, what's the net impact of that? I mean, who are the winners and losers at the moment? Of course, you know, yields have gone down, prices have gone up. What's the net impact on whether it's farmers, traders, processors at the, on the, at the, at the current impact of, you know, of the virus? In the con in the market context, yeah, that's that's a good question, and I think that caused a lot of the the expansion. Initially, the yield impact when people were planting clean stems was fairly small, and farmers were coming off uh, very low prices, so the price had doubled, and maybe they were getting a 10, 20 percent reduction in yield. So they weren't they weren't so concerned. Uh, they were making more money. Yeah. But now they don't have access to the clean stems. So now your yield's fallen uh, um, and the price has come back quite quite a bit. So, you know, farmers are starting are starting to lose. Um, at the processor level, yeah, they're they're a clear loser. Uh, they're not getting the, the feedstock. Um, they're becoming less competitive against, you know, other crops. Um, so yeah, they're definitely not uh, winners, and and starting to or some starting to invest in in how they can multiply clean material to get to get to farmers. Of course, it's not only CMD. Um, cassava witches broom is a problem that perhaps impacts the processor a, li a little differently uh, because it, it has a greater impact on the starch content. So now you're processing one ton of roots and getting instead of 250 tons of starch, maybe you're only getting 150 tons of starch. So it starts to cut into your processing efficiency, cuts into the margin and the price you can pay. So for CMD, like if I talk to a processor in Tainin and say, you know, what's the impact of CMD? They say, well, it's hard to tell, but now we have to get our roots from the Thai border rather than just across the border. Mm. Um, but the roots come in and they may be paying a little bit more. But yeah, I think uh, if you're in an area with, with witch's broom, you really see that impact on your recovery rates. Yeah, yeah. So we've got, we've got a couple of questions posted, one from um, Duang. Um, I was curious if we have a sense of how much the border closures due to COVID have affected cassava exports. Uh, it seems that border closures would have allowed commercial movements, but has it affected individual traders? I think the global trade got got sorted out fairly quickly. Like the the border between the land border between Vietnam and and China was closed for a while, um, but those negotiations I think happened fairly similar. 
and similarly for um, the border between uh, like um, Kampong Cham and, and Tain In, mm. as Dom Dom presented last uh, last week or whatever, there was already that that gap in the value in this value chain where routes got unloaded in no man's land and then reloaded, so you didn't mm. really have the flow of of people. Um, so I don't I don't think it was was that significant. The other thing is, I mean, the bulk of the season was probably over when when the lockdown started. If this if the lockdown started in November, you know, we would have had a huge problem. Um, and then, of course, I mean, we're very lucky to, in the region. I'm sorry for those people listening from elsewhere, but I mean, uh, you know, in in Vietnam, Laos, and and Thailand, it's almost life as usual except where we can't move beyond the on the border so um but the, i mean we talk people talk about the second wave for COVID, but the real the real impact here is going to be when the economy really starts to bite you know for other sectors um you have unemployment you have people returning to villages um you know it's gonna it's gonna be messy um but maybe not, you know, direct but indirect impacts on the cassava sector. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. I mean, there's another question around trade, and it's it's another interesting question around. Um, this is from Mike from and from Panyin um, about how you think the the trade tensions between the U.S. and China might affect China corn policies, and then which in turn, you know, would as you've shown really nicely, what what impacts are they could be likely on the on cassava <coughs> from Southeast Asia. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's probably. Uh, uh, I think it probably good. In, it will add support to the the um, the cassava price in that you'll you'll still you'll see that differential between U.S. corn and, and and Chinese corn remain rather than cheap corn flowing in from 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 the U.S. or. Um, and so that will create that opportunity still for for cassava in, into China. Um, yeah, when we talk about we talk about shocks and and you know certain people can make a tweet <laughs> overnight and then markets yeah. change. So it's um it's one of those unknowns. But I think yeah we're not we're not going to see the Chinese uh, importing large amounts of of U.S. maize in the short term. Would be my guess. Yeah, and and just on that, just to follow that up, from a demand perspective, you know, from a COVID-induced impact on demand, both China demand and globally in the food markets or in the and the cassava kind of end product markets, do you think that there's going to be a real demand suppression, you know, in the months going ahead as as the economic kind of impact bites cons consumption? Uh, yeah, I mean, theory suggests it, it would, and you know, we've been saying that cassava starch is a is a, a normal good, and as people's incomes rise, demand goes up, and as it falls, it, it goes down. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, I'm just I'm just speculating here, and there's probably people who are selling that can can add to it. But for some of those markets, um, you know, one of the big markets for cassava is in the frozen food sector, um, and, and you know, for some products, maybe people as they're locked down and, uh, uh, you know, are, are consuming. I mean, I know my freezer got stockpiled pretty, pretty much. Um, mm. So, so maybe there is some more demand for some processed and storable foods compared to, you know, fresh foods. Um, but yeah, I would only be speculating on that, Rod. So, um, yeah, and it's being recorded, so I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> just another quick follow up because we've got another interesting question here, but just another quick follow up. From from the array of cassava end products, from you know sweeteners to starches to ethanol, when you look at the product potential, is there any segment of the market that you think is really going to be a, a a real profitable part of the market in the next you know two to four years that, that's different to what it is already now? Is there an emerging segment within those end product markets? Um, I mean, two to four years is pretty short, but. I think um, 
you know, the, what we're seeing the, with the waxy cassava, which is just sort of coming online now and with the processes in, in Thailand. Um, uh, so it, it really, uh, they haven't really explored the full kind of opportunities in that, but in that, in that food sector, um, you know, we see a lot of opportunities for these starch traits rather than cassava being, you know, a cheap, a cheap product. Yeah. Um, and and that's where you see the industry investing. But you know, to, to, as as you probably know, hopefully by now, um, is that you know a new variety of cassava is probably eight years from from crossing to to you know in a multi location trial. So you know, it, it's not it's not quick at that at that R and D end. But mm. but that's where we're developing these partnerships with companies like Ingredient or Taiwa or or Tate and Lyle to to look at what the market demands are and how can we um, you know breed a crop that's going to meet consumer preferences. The, the other kind of one that people are thinking about is you know resistant starches and the role of cassava you know addressing health and nutrition issues around diabetes and and things like that. So yeah, this but I mean at this stage the bulk of the market is still in these commodities like sweeteners um, that you are competing on price. So, so you've got to you've got to do both, right? You can't lower productivity due to a disease and remain competitive and think that you're going to move completely to waxy and starches, you know, for the for the drinkable yogurts. Um, if that happens, there will be a large contraction in area and, and a lot of farmers will will suffer. So productivity is also a, a very key thing that we have to maintain. Yeah, yeah. The question from Daniel Lay um, is, is it's a policy question. He's saying um, when you put cassava policies next to other policy for other policies for other grains, they're, they're very different, you know, at the local district level um, in Southeast Asia. Um, and he's saying, so in, if so, what is your view on the motivation of local governments to implement those those policies or to implement any policy around cassava? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think um, cassava probably has the, the worst publicist in the world. Um, we probably need to invest a bit more in our communication because, you know, at national level, um, it gets very little support. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone from Indonesia online, but you know, you have you have the mega commodities of sugarcane and maize and um, cattle and things that are those key priorities that people want to be rice, obviously self-sufficient in and um, and cassava gets little support at the national level. And given the countries that we're working in, um, the provincial and local levels have to basically meet those national level targets. Um, so when you when you're having a meeting after the meeting, you know, over lunch, and they say, look, we 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 recognise that cassava is vitally important to um, the farmers in our province, the ethnic minorities or the poor farmers. Um, um, you know, you can you can kind of get support at that local level, which is what we've we've tried to do. But and it comes back to that data issue, like. You know, we can have a meeting in a district and ask how many hectares of cassava there are. And, and then once we leave the meeting room and I ask how many hectares of cassava are there really, you might you might be out by a factor of five. Yeah. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I think we do have to to tell the story about um, the importance for livelihoods, but also to continue to invest in sustainability and, um, you know, it to get rid of this stigma that, you know, cassava is going to destroy your land and it's an evil crop that's causing deforestation and things like that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Look, we've got one, one, one question, uh, one final question and we, um, we might start ro rolling it up after that. And this is from Tura Chor in um, Myanmar. Um, thanks, Jono. When we check the, the starch price, the Thai starch price, you find that the price has increased in the last couple of weeks. What do you think is about that and what's the reason for it? And is, is it a supply um, side or demand side 
um, cause of that increasing starch price in Thailand. Uh, in the last weeks, I, I'd be speculating there's probably someone from Thailand who who might be better, but I would say it's a supply as a supply issue of, of fresh roots. Um, and but there's also been a little bit of a recovery, I think, in in, in the market from from what it was. Um, but yeah, thanks for the question, Jotura. And it's it's a good point. Like for Jotura, who's a starch processor in Myanmar, you know, COVID had a fairly big impact on them in that the the market basically closed for starch, and um, and and they'd probably largely already purchased the cassava and processed it, and were stockpiling it. So. I'm, I'm sure they start to feel cash flow issues and, and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, there's, there, there's those kind of issues on small processes in Myanmar that that cross-border trade um, would, would start to impact, or, or COVID, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and one final question for me, and this is kind of a little bit of a higher level question back to kind of um, sector development and value chain development. Like as you said, you know, cassava is a both a really important smallholder livelihood crop, but it's also often neglected crop from a policy, you know, government support perspective. Um, from from you know your broad view of the markets, the disease impacts, the productivity issues, the environmental issues, from a livelihood perspective and a and a sector perspective, what are the two most important kind of kind of areas investment areas where for for both livelihood improvement and, and sector competitiveness in cassava what are the two most pressing issues that you think both research and development needs to kind of really get a hand, handle on to improve incomes and 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 competitiveness and and quality and you know, all those things that we need to do yeah i guess uh, i would i would say like in those two segments i mean the first thing is addressing the disease issues and and around clean seed um which we are focusing on at the moment. So in initially getting clean planning material, rapidly multiplying it with, with private sector and distributing it through their, their networks. And as new varieties uh, re with resistance come online, that we already have that infrastructure to get that, that material out as quick as possible. So that addresses the productivity issue. And then on the profitability and the competitiveness issue, um, I think we're already starting to see it um, from private private sector uh, realizing what you can do with modifying the starch traits um, and going for those high end markets. And you know, in the long term, in the long term, I think that's that's going to be key to yeah. to the sector. You can't continue to compete against big maize uh, investment um, with you know. Uh, big companies in huge research budgets. Um, if you're just trying to, you know, the, the yield improvements on cassava were fantastic when the new varieties were released, but they have really, really um, slowed down. You know, a large area of the region still using a variety released, you know, in Thailand, you know, decades ago. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we need to look at those starch traits, which we're starting to do, um, and we're Looking at how you develop those, you know, private partnerships (PPPs) to to develop that and get it into farmers farmers fields. But and I guess like, you know, if I went to Sonla in ten years' time and there was no cassava grown on the steepest of hills, I wouldn't be disappointed. Um, you know, I think we also have to look at where. You know, using some foresight of where markets are going and and what those alternative cropping systems may be, mm. is how do you tra transition? And and the word transition is key, right? You don't just come up with a policy and ban cassava production, uh, and think you're going to improve livelihoods or environmental um, outcomes. You have to look at profitable transitions in areas where we think in ten years' time. You know, growing cassava may not be the best option for for farmers. Yeah, and just on that on that point, it's a really important one. Like in those ten years, do you, do you see that cassava will still be a, a really important smallholder dominated crop, or do you think that there'll be a structural adjustment to larger commercial scale plantings of cassava with bigger economies of scale and and what have you? I mean, do you think where do you think that trend will go? 
Um, I mean, obviously, in, in Vietnam and Thailand, the, the, the ability to get large areas of land and do commercial farming is fairly limited. And, and um, you know, there's concessions in that are, can be granted in, in other hinterland countries like Myanmar and, and that. But, um, you know, obviously, we don't we, we think if you can work with smallholders, if you get industry um, that wants to invest in their, their smallholders, that you can actually be productive. Yeah. Um, until you get, you know, when labor gets so expensive that you've got to go to large scale mechanization, which is it's not the easiest thing to do in cassava compared to, you know, maize or something. Um, so, yeah, I think the smallholders will persist, um, but there will be there will be some some industry set up in the in the sort of frontier that will be seeking out larger areas, um, and, and that's kind of a it's a policy balancing act, right? So, mm. if if I was a if I was going to if I was a starch processor and I wanted to invest in Lao, I, I need some confidence that when the price of maize goes up, all my farmers aren't going to grow maize. So before I make that investment decision, you know, if, if I know that I've got some estate that I, that I can I can work off, then, you know, that helps that investment decision. But of course, if you give it too much, then then you're not going to improve, you know, improve efficiency, uh, sorry, livelihood. So it's kind of that, again, policy balance. How do you encourage the investment in the processing uh, and improving livelihoods of, of your people? And uh, that's, I think, not that's for every sector. And uh, it's something that I hope the conversation continues about. Excellent. No, I think that's a really good place to end, Jono. So um, look, thank you again very much for the preparation and the delivery of that presentation. It, it's kind of brings together a huge amount of experience not only of your own, but the people that you deal with and work with um, and analysis. And I think it's a really it's a really unique and valuable thing.